about three lectures you're giving? Okay, so there's on Martin Linda, the other oh, lectures. <laughs> spaced out over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, you're not coming to all tonight. <laughs> so we're delighted to welcome back Dr. Mohamed Naik Carl, who is our lecturer, who is on the board of trustees here at the museum and has been a vibrant member and speaker for several years before I came. And um, she has done extensive research on this topic, the Martin Green topic, and you'll be delighted to know next month she's giving a lecture on Tana French and kind of Irish Gothic horror type stuff. So mark your calendars, I'm doing a newsletter today. Um, so Meg teaches at the University of Pharmacy, uh, College, College, College of Pharmacy. College of Pharmacy. And Health Sciences. And okay, Health Sciences is lovely. And uh, you know, she, as I say, very active board member. She's head of our programming department too, and Debbie and Chris, I was happy you're on that. So delighted to have her. Thank you all for coming out. It's um, you know tough with these COVID times to navigate with social distancing, but we're doing it. So I'm going to turn the lights off, make it very romantic because it's hard to see that screen. Sometimes it looks a bit fuzzy. And uh, may take it away. Okay. <laughs> thank you everyone for coming. Uh, and good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here. So tonight I am going to be talking to you about Martin Glenn and a series of essays he wrote in 1919 on the Irish and the American Revolution. Now some of you may be asking yourselves, who is Martin Glenn? And I ask myself the same question and many people ask that question, so you're not alone. Even though he was a prominent early 20th century American figure with ties to Albany and the Irish, he really isn't very well known. He made a name for himself in New York State and national politics in journalism and in Irish affairs in the early 20th century, and he lived in Albany all of his adult life. His brownstone on Willis Street bears a commemorative plaque. His country home in South Bethlehem has served many functions. I think it's a, a wedding venue now. And his mausoleum stands at St. Agnes Cemetery in Menand. He was lost to history, however, for much of the 20th century until Galatian native Dominic Lizzy wrote a biography of Glenn, appropriately entitled, or subtitled, Forgotten Hero, which contributed to a small resurgence of interest in Glenn's historical importance, symbolized perhaps by the restoration of the Glenn Mausoleum at the cemetery. Apparently in the 90s, uh, the mausoleum was, was filthy dirty, there were vines all over it, and the shrubbery had sort of obscured the, the entrance into it. So after Dominic Lizzi wrote his book, he uh, led a group of people to clean it up, and it looks like this today. All right, so uh, some highlights of his resume for us tonight. Glenn was born in Columbia County in 1871 and was the son of Irish immigrants. He was governor of New York, the first Catholic governor from 1912 to 1914, and he worked at and then owned the Albany Times Union from the late 1890s until 1924. He was deeply interested in both Irish and Irish American history and was a prominent voice for Irish independence in the early 20th century, using his access to the media to support the Irish cause. He died in 1924 in Albany. Tonight I'd like to give you a more detailed background on Glenn and tell you about the series of essays he wrote on the Irish and the American Revolution. Before I start, however, I have to begin with a disclaimer. I am not a historian. I'm an English teacher and a native Albanian. And I, I also have an interest in Irish literature and things Irish. And my interest in Glenn developed as an interest really in my own family history. I thought, well, if I learn about the Irish in Albany, maybe I can find out about the Irish Albany that my, my own family lived in. Um, so I began a quest to find out about the Irish in Albany. So back in the 1990s, historian and then assemblyman Jack McEnany said to me, if I'm interested in my family's history, I really should read up on Cardinal John McCluskey and Governor Martin Glenn. At the time, the only thing I knew about Cardinal McCluskey was that it was a high school and rivaled my own alma mater, Vincentian. And I knew nothing about Martin Glenn. Jack suggested I begin by reading a recently published ethnic study titled Irish America by sociologist Reginald Byron. Byron used Albany as a case study for his examination of Irish identity in 20th century United States and wrote of the impact both McCluskey and Glenn had on the Irish in Albany. Byron recently died, kind of an interesting sidebar. Byron recently died, and his widow just gave the museum boxes of his research material for this book. So anyway, I did just that. So tonight's lecture, and I'm sorry I keep looking behind me, I'm not sure this is moving. There we go. 
So tonight's lecture is a, a result of some of that research and is the first of a three-part series Elizabeth has generously invited me to give over the next six months that focuses on aspects of Martin Glynn's interest in Ireland, his impact on Irish American identity, and the small role he played in the Irish American peace talks in 1921. Glynn's interest is directly related to his family, oops, to his family and uh, his childhood and his study of history, and his impact is directly related to the career, to his career as a journalist. Yeah. But I don't think she did that though. Uh -oh. oh, I must have um, <laughs> somehow. Not your uh -oh. Oh, I have no idea how to do this, guys. Hang on now, one second. I don't, well, I don't know how you did it from down there. There you go. Good. Okay. Go back a little bit. Yeah, mistake number one, we experienced. Let's see. Okay, thank you. All right, well, uh, let's see. During his long career, I guess I can remember what, what slide I was on. During his long career at the Times Union, he wrote regularly about Irish affairs in his editorials. He personally laid out page one, and Irish news appeared regularly and prominently uh, on the, on, in the newspaper. The height of Glynn's career ran side by side with the most turbulent years in 20th century Ireland, 1913 to 1923. Glynn was a member and officer of state and local Hibernian society, and he spoke regularly at their function. And as I just mentioned, he played a small, small role as liaison between Ireland and Great Britain during the Irish War of Independence in 1921. These facets of his life will be the topics of later talks. Tonight my talk on his essays about the Irish and the American Revolution has two parts. Glynn's life and how that provides the context for the essays, and of course the content and tone in the nine essays themselves published in the Albany Times Union. Uh, so let's begin with his life. As I already mentioned, Glenn was born in Columbia County, New York, the county just southeast of Albany County in 1871, and the town of Kinderhook. He was the second of seven children to Martin Glenn and Anne Scanlon Glenn, emigrants from County Clare, Mayo. Martin Sr. and his siblings were part of the mass migration of the famine years in Ireland and settled in various parts of Columbia County, where they worked primarily on se as seasonal farm laborers with hundreds of other Irish immigrants. When Martin Jr. was five, the family moved to the north, northern Columbia County town of Valacia, where Glynn's parents opened a saloon and Martin Sr. supplemented the household with a job on the railroad. Martin Jr. worked in the saloon from the age of five until he was 18, and according to Lizzie's biography, the young Glynn was forever shaped by the political and labor pub talk of the mostly Irish immigrants. Uh, the slide here, you can see three pictures of Main Street in Valacia from 1906, 1914, and 1917. And then the picture up in the top left is the, the Glynn Saloon with the building of what it looks like today, the inset. And most of these pictures come from Dominic Lizzie's books. And he very generously uh, said I could use any of the pictures in tonight's talk. So the Irish pastor of St. John's Catholic Church in Valacia pushed Glynn to continue his education after high school. And the young Martin entered Fordham University in the fall of 1890, where the intellectual rigor and classical education of the Jesuits found the perfect host. Lizzie writes that Glynn grew into a deep thinking and broadly educated young man, marked by a profound love of history and exceptional rhetorical and oratorical skills. He graduated in 1894, the recipient of several subject prizes in his four years. Thanks to an archivist at Fordham, we have two college program pages up here the first from Glenn's freshman year and the second from his graduation program. Uh, there were also uh, class pictures through the 1880s and 1890s, but sadly the, the photo of 1894 is missing. Lizzie said that Glenn was the valedictorian, however, of his class. And I think I'll mention here, even though it doesn't, isn't as pertinent to today's talk, but it'll factor in later, that Glenn was an avid athlete before Fordham. He especially loved baseball and reportedly played played well and wanted to play at Fordham, but he injured his back the summer before his freshman year. An injury Lizzie speculates may have been the result of a dive into the quarry where young people swam in Valacia. As a result, he, couldn't, he, he could not play sports for the rest of his life and suffered the, from chronic back pain. At Fordham, he volunteered, however, as scorekeeper and team manager for his beloved baseball. 
After graduation, Glenn moved back to the Columbia County town seat of Hudson. And although he studied law at Albany Law School and passed the New York State Bar in 1897, he never practiced bar. Rather, he entered the profession that would dominate the rest of his life, journalism. He was hired by the Hudson Weekly Record, and this is a more contemporary picture of Main Street in Hudson, where he befriended the powerful Purcell family of Hudson. James Purcell, a rag to riches Irish immigrant, was a shareholder in the paper and gave Glenn his start. He was also a powerful supporter of the Democratic Party in Columbia County and introduced Glenn to politics, especially Democratic politics. After two years, after two, uh, let's see, after two years, two of his friends from Fordham, brothers Joseph and James Farrell from Albany, provided the contact for Glenn with the Albany Times Union. And this is a picture from Lizzie's book, and in the back of the buggy, Martin Glenn is sitting with Joseph Farrell. Joseph and James's father, John Farrell, also the son of Irish immigrants, owned the paper, owned the Albany Times Union, and on his son's recommendation, he hired Glenn. Uh, the Farrells were a prominent family in Albany, and this is uh, John Glenn's obituary. It's from a New York paper, The Sun, not the Albany Times Union. I probably should have found that one. But you can see some interesting things in this obituary. He was the son-in-law of Anthony Brady, so his wife was a Brady. And those of you who were uh, born in Brady Hospital or Bella Brady Hospital in Albany, that's the same Brady family. You can also see down here that uh, at his funeral, Governor-elect Al Smith and Martin Glynn attend. And if you look over here with the pallbearers, Martin Glynn was one of the pallbearers. Let's see, if you're familiar with the Academy of the Holy Names on New Scotland Avenue, you've probably noticed a giant bell in a cupola in the front lawn called the Farrell Bell, given the Holy Names by John Farrell and his wife in the early 20th century when the school was on Madison Avenue across from Washington Park. Thanks to the opportunity provided by the Farrells, Glenn would remain with the paper as sales manager, editor-in-chief, publisher, and finally owner for the rest of his life. Glenn became a resident of Albany with a Times Union job in July 1898. And actually, I'm a little, I haven't fully worked out the, the dates. He graduated from Fordham in 1894. And then I read that he went right to Hudson to work for the Hudson newspaper. But somehow he graduates from Albany Law in 1897. So I don't know how he was living in Albany and in Hudson at the time. But anyway, he's back in Albany in 1898. And it's to this city that he had his greatest impact as both journalist and as a politician. In 1891, Glenn married Mary McGrain from Lynn, Massachusetts, daughter of Irish immigrants from County, County Loud. Their names were Patrick and Mary Thornton McGrain. Patrick McGrain was another rag to riches Irishman who settled in Lynn after arrival in Boston and made his fortune in retail. Mary came to Albany after their marriage and Glenn continued at the Times Union while getting more involved in New York State politics. He served his first political elected office. He served as a single term as congressman between 1899 and 1901 from the 20th district, which included Albany. And then a few years later, he served as New York State Comptroller, then New York State Lieutenant Governor, and finally Governor of New York State between 1907 and 1914. And these two pictures are of Glenn when he was, when he was governor. He gave a brilliant keynote address at the 1916 Democratic National Convention in support of Woodrow Wilson. His political career, however, however, which should have soared after the convention, ultimately left him frustrated because Wilson did an abrupt switch from being a peace candidate, and that's what Glenn spoke about at the convention, to being a supporter of the Great War. So that kind of left, left Glenn behind. So it's to journalism then that we have to look to him for his greatest success. Glenn used the Times Union to defend and promote Irish concerns and causes even before the revolutionary decade. His lifelong interest and involvement in Irish and Irish American affairs began with his own family, then grew through the concerns of Irish immigrants in his Belisha family saloon and parish church. There was an Irish presence at Fordham and the influential Purcells of Hudson, the McGrains of Lynn, Massachusetts, and the Farrells and Brady's of Albany. His progressive political views were shaped by the labor difficulties of the Irish immigrant population and his defense of Irish independence was influenced by both his heritage and his politics. Once at Albany, Glynn joined state, local, and national Irish American councils, committees, and organizations. He hired recent Irish immigrants to staff his city and country homes. Uh, this is museum trustee, Pat Hale, 
he, his maternal grandmother, this is sort of a, a little a personal anecdote with the, the staff of the Glynn's household in Albany. Anyway, Pat's maternal grandmother, Catherine O'Toole, and I put Pat up there because we didn't have a picture of his grandmother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pat's maternal grandmother, Catherine O'Toole, worked for the Glynn's. She came from County Galway with four of her sisters and a brother. So the, the six siblings came to work for the McGrains in Lynn, Massachusetts. And then Catherine moved to Albany to work for the Glynn's when Mary married Martin. Catherine met her future husband through the Glynn's because he worked for them in their summer home in, at Cedar Hill in South Bethlehem. Pat's grandmother told him stories of a famous Irishman who would stay with the Glynn's on Willett Street when they were visiting or performing in Ireland. For example, Irish tenor John McCormick stayed with the Glynn's whenever he sang at Albany's Harmonic Quaker Hall. And according to Pat, Glynn always gave his Irish staff tickets to the concerts. After the show, McCormick and Glynn would sit in the kitchen with Catherine and the other Irish staff and sing more songs. <laughs> Eamon de Valera was another official guest of the Glynn's when on his fundraising tour of the United States in 1919. But Catherine told Pat that unofficially, uh, Dev stayed more often with the Glynn's. And then it was political conversation that took place at the kitchen table. When De Valera was captured in 1916, the 1916 Rising, it was through Glynn that President Wilson made contact with Lloyd George, reminding him that Dev was an American citizen and warning, warning him of America's disapproval if Dev was executed. The way Pat's grandmother told the story, Glenn threatened Lloyd George with an Irish landing in the American Marines on the Irish shores if Dev was executed <laughs> or even harmed. So by the early teens, Glenn was a dominant figure in Irish American affairs and a friend of Eamon de Valera's. This involvement, his access to the media, his profound knowledge of history, and heightened awareness of the Irish in the United States account for a series of essays he wrote and published in the Times Union in late 1919 on the Irish in the American Revolution. The series is a general recognition of the Irish in American history and represents not only Glynn's lengthiest accounts of the, role the, of the role the Irish played in the revolution, but one of the earliest published accounts. And while the tone of the essay sounds like cleverly amusing hyperbole and appears to be intentionally bombastic, you remember Thomas Cahill's book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. This could be subtitled, How the Irish Won the Revolution. <laughs> there is an underlying seriousness to them, a recognition, a reminder, and a remembrance of the Irish and the American story from the very beginning. The more specific context for the series was a direct response to a tirade made in Congress by a US Senator, a vicious attack by Mississippi Senator John Sharp Williams on Irish Americans made on the Senate floor in October 1919. Williams's tirade was in turn prompted by the attention given to the Irish question begun after the Easter Rising of 1916 and intensified after the general election in Ireland in December 1918, in which the Sinn Féin party won 73 of 101 seats and representatives refused to take their seats in London, formed their own assembly in Dublin, and declared their independence from Great Britain thereby kickstarting the Irish War of Independence. The Irish sought the recognition of the United States and other countries of the world. It was also intensified by the Versailles peace talks in 1919 and 1920. The Allied victors in World War I were thrashing out a peace treaty which included a proposal for freedom for all small nations, prompting debates in Congress about Ireland. Sinn Féin and Irish American groups, such as the Friends of Irish Freedom, founded in 1916 to promote Irish independence, lobbied hard for Congress to mandate that Irish independence be part of the terms of the treaty. In March 1919, by a vote of 216 to 41, as reported by the New York Times, a joint resolution passed in Congress expressed, quote, the hope of Congress at the peace conference at Paris would favor self-determination for Ireland, end quote. And on March 8, 1919, the strident pressure of Irish and Irish American groups was reported in the New York Times. And the, the quotation is up here. If the Irish question is not settled by the peace conference, friends of Ireland will stop ratification of the League of Nations in the American Congress. Sean O'Kelly, the delegate of the provisional Irish Republic to the peace conference asserted in a statement today. By June 7, 1919, the U.S. Senate officially requested the Peace Commission at Versailles hear the clause of Ireland by a vote of 60 to 1. 
the one dissenter being John Sharp Williams. His sympathy for the Irish cause was part of the revolution. The Irish lobby in Washington took another focus when the June congressional discussion of the League of Nations turned to Article 10, the first sentence of which states, the members of the League shall undertake to respect and preserve against external aggression the territorial integrity and existing political independence of all members of the League. Irish and Irish American groups opposed this article because they feared it would be interpreted as British sovereignty over Ireland. In late June 1919, Nathan de Valera, now the president of the New Ireland, slipped into the U.S. to lobby, was slipped into the U.S. to lobby for U.S. recognition of Ireland, raise money, and speak against Article 10. And this is when he stayed with the, the Glynns in Albany. Coupled with the sentiment was the ongoing agenda of the Friends of whoops, Friends of Irish Freedom. Part of FOIF's agenda was to counter what the Irish American societies perceived as a pro-British sentiment in the United States. So throughout 1919, Congress debated Irish, is Irish issues. Simultaneously, the Friends of Irish Freedom was printing material highlighting the accomplishments of the Irish in America. In October 1919, whoops, let's see, I'm sorry, I don't know if I skipped over a slide, I guess not. In October 1919, the Democratic Senator from Mississippi, John Sharp Williams, erupted on the Senate floor yelling, and I'm not gonna read this quotation yet, but he erupted on the Senate floor yelling that the FOIF was, quote, packing the galleries with scoundrels, end quote. As reported in the New York Times, he said he was sick and tired of it all, particularly claims that the Irish won the War of the Revolution and subsequently were mainly responsible for the defeat of the Irish in the Civil War. So now I'll get to this quotation. On the Senate floor that day, he also said with unabashed nativism that he had, quote, received many intimidating letters. Some signed even with O something or Mick something. They have written me that, that these Yankees, they called them damned Yankees, did not win the Civil War, but the Irish who whipped the people down south. I am tired of that eternal lie. I am tired of this intimidation that I've received in my office for the last three or four months. The Sinn Feiners might take a lesson from the veterans of the Confederacy, who, when the war was over, did not keep it up by shooting the Yankees from behind trees. Most of the good in the way of law and order and civilization in the world today is of Anglo-Saxon origin. The Irishmen might learn a little bit of something from us if they have any sense, and I doubt whether they have or not. It has not been, this continues a little bit, it has not been many days since I heard upon, uh, it has not been many days since I heard upon this floor a pretense that over 50% of the American revolutionary troops were Irish when we gained our independence. Only 4% of the population in the United States at the time was Irish, and two thirds of the 4% 4 4 were Scotch-Irish, English-Irish, and Ulsterites. The Irish never whipped the South at all. They could not whip the South at any time. It is a part of the braggart nature of the Irish. They're always contending that they have done everything, everywhere, at every time. I am tired of this business. I am tired of this vanity and nonsense. I do not care how many Irishmen vote for the Democratic ticket. And Williams was a Democrat. <laughs> there was dissent in the Senate after this, but the most developed response came from Martin Glynn. In November and December of 1919, he published nine articles over nine weeks in the Times Union, each discussing an aspect of the Irish role in the American Revolution, each refuting comments made by Senator Williams and each repeating Williams' name over and over again. Then in 1920, encouraged by other members of the Irish American community, Glenn published the articles as a, I think it's a 40 page document, uh, using the Times Union Press with the title, The Irish and the American Revolution, and the subtext, as you can see, a series of papers in reply to the attack of US Senator John Sharp Williams on the Irish. Uh, the New York State Library has several copies of this of this document, and they've digitized it, so it's free online if you want to read the whole 40 pages. Um, so I, I'll talk a little bit about some of these articles now, and I just want to also begin by saying uh, that I'm not looking at these for historical accuracy. Many of you, I'm sure in the audience, uh, and I know Elizabeth is a historian, might see some, uh, some mistakes and miscalculations. But it's more looking at this as, as a piece of literature, at his tone, at his, at his style, at his rhetorical devices, and what this says about Glenn and his commitment to, to the Irish. So anyway, Article 1 opens with the following disclaimer. Quote, 
in running these articles in reply to John Sharp Williams' attack on the Irish in the Revolution, we, and I would note the pronoun we, he's speaking, he's including himself as he speaks about the Irish. He says, we do not claim the Irish were the whole thing in the Revolution. We do not claim the Irish did it all, but we do assert that the Irish did their share. And we defy John Sharp Williams or any other sour devils to prove they didn't. Beginning with George Washington forming his army, the opening battles of Concord and Lexington and Bunker Hill, and moving through battles in New York and New Jersey, the crossing of the Delaware, battles in Pennsylvania, and the winter at Valley Forge, southern battles in Virginia and South Carolina, up to the victory of Yorktown, Glynn tells a story in his first article of the rebels' courageous losses and valiant victories, and includes the names of scores of Irish officers who played critical roles in the revolution and stood by George Washington. He names 70 officers of 25 battles and the parts they played. He quote, and plus he quotes outside sources, such as, make sure I have the right slide, such as George Washington Park Custis, who was George Washington's foster son, who said, quote, when our friendless standard was first unfurled for resistance, who were strangers, meaning foreigners, that first mustered round the staff when it reeled in the fight, who more bravely sustained it than, Aaron, than Aaron's generous sons, who felt the privations of the camp, the fate of battle, or the horrors of the prison ship more keenly than the Irish? Washington loved them, for they were the companions of his toil, his peril, his glories, and the deliverance of the country. He quotes professor of history at the University of Michigan in the inscription on the monument at the Battle of Newtown that praises the courage of Sullivan's brigade. He quotes poems about Moylan's dragoons, the Philly regiment under Stephen Moylan, uh, and just a couple of lines to read. In the beginning, he says, at Trenton, Monmouth, Germantown, our sabers were not slack. Like lightning next to Charlestown, we scourged the British back. And then it ends with, hurrah then for the Schuylkill side, its pleasant woody dells, old Ulster well may warm with pride when each his story tells. Glenn also tells the story of Molly Pitcher, who continues to fight after her, uh, for her Irish husband after he is gunned down in battle and he quotes numerous congressional tributes to the Irish. He quotes the enemy officer, General Burgoyne, to the House of Commons, and Lord Mountjoy to the House of Lords. Mountjoy said, quote, America was lost by Irish immigrants. I am assured from the best authority, the major part of the American army was composed of Irish, and the Irish language was as commonly spoken in the American ranks as English. I am also informed it was their valor that determined the contest. He even quotes Williams himself in a speech he made five years ago in support of the Irish. And all the quotations are about the valor of the Irish in the war, all in response to Williams' accusations. Glenn's celebrated strengths, his broad understanding of history, and his encyclopedic knowledge of historical detail, his skilled use of rhetorical details, his seemingly humorous tone belying his emotional and intellectual commitment to what he writes, he brings to the cause of the Irish and are readily apparent. In the manner of his Irish forebears, Glynn comes at his serious topic humorously to entertain his readers without appearing to preach. His tone shifts from mock high oratory by the end to an earnest exhortation to celebrate the role of the Irish in American history from the very beginning of the nation. Here's an example of the style evident in all nine essays. So note some of his techniques. Note the lists of names and battles, the cadence of his prose, repetition, and the author's emotional investment. So um, I apologize for all these words up on a slide, but I wanted you to hear the language and uh, you can follow along as I read. So Glenn is writing. Then came the Battle of Germantown, where Washington assigned Sullivan and Wayne and Conway, Irishmen the three of them, to advance by the way to Chestnut Hill, while Armstrong, an Irishman, he sent to attack the British in the left and the rear. Nor were these the only Irish officers who fought with Washington. General Knox fought there, General James Irvine fought there, General Reed fought there, General Nash fought there, and so did Colonel Stephen Moylan, and Colonel Thomas Proctor, and Major Irvine, and Captain Andrew Porter, and Captain Thomas Porter, and Captain Andrew Irvine. When the smoke of battle had cleared away, General Nash, Nash and Major Irvine lay dead upon the battlefield. And they were Irishmen, John Sharp Williams, they were Irishmen. This last sentence emerges as a refrain used after each historical example through the series of essays bringing with it the incessant repetition of and direct address to the Mississippi Senator. 
At the end of the first article, Glenn, Glenn sums up the role of the Irish at the end of the, war, uh, end of the war. Note the same features of detail and style, in particular the repetition of the word Irishman. When Cornwallis surrendered, when 28 British regiments handed over their colors, the colors were received by a young Irishman named Robert Wilson. When Washington selected a man to carry the news of Cornwallis's surrender to the Continental Congress of Philadelphia, he picked an Irishman by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Tillman. When Tillman delivered the message of Philadelphia, he delivered it to an Irishman, Thomas McKean, president of the Continental Congress. When the message was read to Congress, it was read by an Irishman, Charles Thompson, long its venerated secretary. Yet John Sharp Williams pooh poohs the Irish in the American Revolution. This last sentence is another one of, Glenn, of uh, Glenn's refrains. In the next eight articles, and don't worry, I'm not going to take a lot of time with the next eight articles. <laughs> <laughs> in the next eight articles, using the same attention to detail, the same rhetorical devices, which give the prose the intensity of a mock sermon, as I've suggested delaying a serious message, Glenn writes in depth about some of the individuals mentioned in Article 1. Article 2 opens with, John Sharp Williams, U.S. Senator from Mississippi, pooh poohs the Irish in the American Revolution, and yet an Irishman was the first commissioned captain of the Colonial Navy. Then there follows a long description of his accomplishments, and it, that paragraph ends with, and where George Washington placed this Irishman, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson kept him. And the Irishman who did this, all this John Sharp Williams, the Irishman who did all this, was fighting old Jack Barry. Article three begins with the same incantation and celebrates the role of William Jasper, hero of Fort Moultrie. Some sources claim he's German, but some say Irish, and Glenn went with Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Article four focuses on the Irish families with multiple members in the war, the six Irvines, the five Butlers, the five Lewises, and the three Gibbons. Article five zooms in on Jack Sullivan, who sold British gunpowder powder even before shots were fired at Lexington and Concord what Glenn refers to as, quote, the first real act of war waged by the colonists against Great Britain, end quote, and matches this first victory on land with the first victory at sea by Maurice O'Brien, although it really may have been his son Jeremiah, but both were born in court. Um, Article six features Tim Murphy, the hero of Saratoga. Article seven, Matthew Lyon, the Green Mountain boy who fought with Ethan Allen in the, in the capture of Fort Ticonderoga. Article eight examines Richard Montgomery of Protestant ascendancy stock, who left the British army to settle in America and who fought valiantly with the rebels as an American patriot. The last article, the last article concludes the series with Glenn finding support for his argument with quotes from George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and the Continental Congress. He notes the 10 Irish signatories of the Declaration of Independence, and these are the 10 he mentions I couldn't find all 10 on there. <laughs> they may be there, but uh, anyway, I think I found eight. Um, he also talked about the Irishmen who printed and distributed the Declaration, the seven, plus the seven Irish signatories to the federal constitution, Irishmen who defended the American cause before parliament, and Tories who recognized the Irish role before parliament, such as Joseph Galloway, a Tory who told the English House of Commons on October 27, 1779, that one half of Washington's Continental Army was Irish. And throughout the series, Glenn's breeziness conveys important arguments. He both celebrates the, celebrates the individual Irish officers and also praises the unnamed Irish enlisted men in their vast numbers. From the many Irish names among the Minutemen, he highlights the, the praise of the last loyalist, he, he, he highlights the names of, of men, uh, the, uh, the Irish Minutemen, I'm sorry. He also highlights the praise of the last loyalist governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchison, who said, quote, without the Irish, do I have that? Yeah. Without the Irish rebels in Massachusetts, the opposition to the king could not have succeeded. He lists the hundreds of Irish names on the rolls of Bunker Hill and quotes the army rosters throughout the war showing, quote, a large number of Irishmen in Washington's New York regiments a large number still of Irishmen in his Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia regiments, and a good sprinkling of Irishmen among his New England troops, especially from New Hampshire. Glenn includes anecdotes of the whole regiment wearing sprigs of green in honor of the value of the valor of the Irish troops when they marched into Philadelphia. So large, so large a part did Irishmen play in these victories over the British, Glenn writes, 
that at the jubilation banquet of the American forces, one of the toasts proposed was, may the kingdom of Ireland merit a strike in the American standard. With Glenn's recognition of these forgotten heroes, this, this intentional bombast raises to more of a prayer-like chant as he uses the powerful rhetorical device of repetition again to hammer home his point. We believe that Dan Morgan was an Irishman and that his father came from Londonderry. But if by any chance Morgan himself was Welsh, and I think he was Welsh, a large proportion of Morgan's men who won Morgan's victories, a large proportion of Morgan's men who wore in their hearts the motto of liberty or death, a large proportion of Morgan's men who won the Battle of Saratoga while he vegetated in his tent and cogitated on his couch, a large proportion of Morgan's men who Washington Irving says were of single efficiency in the Revolutionary War, who Julian Hawthorne said enlisted for one year and fought for eight, were Irishmen, John Sharp Williams. A large proportion of Morgan's men were Irishmen. Glenn's concluding words replay the refrain addressed directly to Williams. It is this unrelenting repetition of Williams' names that adds power and force to the final question of the final article. If the Irish, I think, if the Irish did not play a grand, a noble, a resplendent, and heroic part in, Amer in the American Revolution, we ask you, John Sharp Williams, how comes it that Washington heaped such honors upon Irishmen? How comes it that Washington had so many Irishmen around him? How comes it that Washington placed Irishmen in responsible places in every battle in which he commanded? Answer these questions, John Sharp Williams. Answer them if you can. And if you can't, in the name of justice and fair play, cease your vapid vaporings about the Irish and the American Revolutionary War. The whole series of articles funnels into the final paragraph, which leaves us with numbers. 1,500 officers of Irish blood in the Revolutionary Army and Navy, where we find 695 Kellys, 494 Murphys, 327 Connors and O'Connors, 331 McCarthys, 322, 322 Ryans, 386 Rileys, 266 Sullivans, 248 Dorothys, 243 Connellys, 221 Burks and 230 O'Briens, and 178 O'Neills, and 184 Fitzgeralds, and 155 Donnellys, among many other Irish names. <laughs> Glenn's pamphlet was distributed to Irish American organizations around the country, and on December 15, 1919, when the New York Times reported that Senator Williams would not seek re-election. One wonders if his reported disgust at the Senate treatment of international affairs, his reported lost interest in political life, his reported preference for being a, do for being a, for rather, for being a <coughs> being at the moon rather than remaining in the Senate, had anything to do with the essays of Martin Glynn. I'll close with Glynn's last sentence. When John Sharp Williams pooh-poohs what the Irish did in the American, in the Revolution, he poo poos his own knowledge of history and his own fairness of mind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if anyone has any questions, I'm sure Elizabeth will be able to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off tonight. <laughs> yes. Um, so I uh, don't want to put you on the spot because I know you gave us a disclaimer, but you're not a historian, so I'm not going to ask this hopefully in a historical way. Oh, um, <laughs> but I also realize it's very easy to sort of superimpose like modern understanding on past events because we just have that much more information. But from sort of an artistic perspective, I noticed that um, particularly the poem you quoted, of course, mentions um, Ulster specifically, and there's a lot of surnames in there like Armstrong, Knox, Irvine. Um, etc. that are actually Montgomery, um, that are actually uh, surnames that are very commonly shared with Scotland and are actually also, in this case, a lot of the times um, evidence of like, Scots Irish or uh, migration of Scots to Ulster. Um, and I'm wondering, from sort of an artistic perspective, what we possibly could learn <laughs> from Glyn claiming them as Irish when perhaps today people in Ulster who descend from those same people would not consider themselves Irish at all. Um, I know that perhaps that sort of splitting hairs is not around in the time of the revolution, but I'm wondering, particularly at the time that Glenn is writing with this idea of Irish independence and home rule and Scots Irish and um, other perhaps Irish Protestant people being more unionist, what that means to be claiming them as Irish, even though I definitely agree that they are at least some some sort of some way Irish, considering that their families live there and settled there and you know 
developed it for however long. Um, but it's just some, I mean, everyone wants to play identity politics all the time, but I find it very interesting that a lot of people who are of Scott Irish staff are very happy to claim um, their participation in the American Revolution, but would say with a qualifier that it's not Irish people, they're not Irish people. Um, so from sort of an artistic perspective when writing about it, I'm wondering what we can possibly learn from including them in this group. <laughs> well, and certainly included Ulster, Ulster, people from the north, right. like the northern nine Ulster counties and right. the Irish. He didn't distinguish religion. Yeah. Like the Catholicism doesn't come up mm -hmm. come up much. So he's looking at that whole island. This is before partition, mm -hmm. you know, close to it. And actually that, you know, that did break his heart when that happened. But uh, again, I, I guess that, that identity thing is very interesting, mm -hmm. interesting in the north. Um, my niece's future mother-in-law is from Derry, mm -hmm. and she grew up Catholic, and she's Catholic, and she identifies as Irish, mm -hmm. but she said her Protestant neighbor identifies as British. Mm -hmm. uh, she has an Irish passport, he has a British passport. Um, so that's such a fluid thing. Um, I guess I, I like Glenn's, the way Glenn looks at it, that the relig religion doesn't matter, this is an island. It may have been intentional, though, like, on his behalf, in the middle of this crisis mm -hmm. of Ireland, you know, coming up for all the dependence and after 1916 and stuff, like maybe he's deliberately pulling in a group that might be reluctant to claim their own Irishness and he's saying, no, you are, like you came from this mm -hmm. island and you contributed here. Right. So maybe he's right. trying to smooth, you know, relations right. at yeah. home that has nothing to do with here. I think it's just yeah. even yeah. bigger, you know, yeah. Interesting even today that um, the Irish Embassy in DC has a portrait, I, I'm assuming they still do, I used to live in DC, so I saw it there once, um, of, contemporaries of Washington that were in his army or people of Irish staff around his time that were important. And a lot of them are people you actually mentioned here. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually read, like if you sit down and you read like, like who they are people and where they came from, like Montgomery's family, was, he was born in Dublin, but his parents were Ulster Scots. Like there's a lot of people that even like the modern Irish state, again, I don't say it's right or wrong, it's not my call, but they claim as Irish. And then it's interesting just to see how many people who might have said, you know, this is my ancestor, I don't identify as Irish, but you know, this is this is their history and it's funny, especially considering how many Scots Irish people may have fought in the revolution here, but who actually want Britain to stay in Ireland now where they are and um, yeah. back home. So and how did they self-identify too? Right, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. funny yeah. to see how much it changes. But what's interesting is so many of the quotes do mention the importance of the Irish, right. yeah. the way Washington was talking about yeah. the, the, the numbers. Is that Chris? I was gonna ask a different question, but maybe maybe this ties the first one with that. And that was, <clears throat> John Sharp Williams was from Mississippi, a place that we don't, I think, typically think of as having a particularly Irish identity. So what I was wondering about was, did you see any evidence that Glenn's rejoinder upset Williams? Uh, and did he take the bait and respond? And, and I'm wondering, getting to your question, Perhaps one of the reasons that Glenn cast a very broad net of who was Irish was to take on Williams, mm -hmm. to say, you know, these people are Irish, that includes you, and you've just been insulted by this man, uh, you know, which would include people maybe in Mississippi uh, or in constituencies that, that matter to a John Sharp Williams. Mm -hmm. Because if you notice, one of, in one of Williams' quotes, he says, you know, the Irish think they did everything, every place, every right. time, but 4% uh, of the population was Irish and two thirds or one third of them were Ulsterites. And he's, he makes the distinction right. between uh, the Irish and people from, uh, from the North. But you're right, Glenn kind of ignores that and does cast the net. Then over there that, might have, that might have caused trouble for Williams. Well, back home. Because he's now listing people, you know, Maybe a John Sharp Williams and maybe people in Mississippi in 19, yeah. you know, 15, 18, whatever we're talking about here, wouldn't particularly put care if their senator had smeared a bunch of Irish Catholics whose mm -hmm. right. descendants both live in New York and Massachusetts and places like that. But by casting this net, he's impugned, you know, or Glenn is suggesting that he's impugned yeah. people of good stock from Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama and yeah. Georgia and places that, you know, that I would say a John Sharp Williams would have cared a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. He does make that, Williams does, though, make this comment about good Anglo-Saxons <laughs> <laughs> to distinguish one group from another. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right. You know. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Did, did young Sharp Williams respond? Is there any, is yeah. there any history of that? I do. That's a, a, oh, I'll have to look that up. I, I don't know if he did. He did get out of the Senate shortly after yeah. that, but um, I don't know if he did after that one outburst on the Senate floor. I'm reading the book now, Meg. Uh, sorry to cry back in the winter. Real, real slow read. But uh, <laughs> it's actually it's a Bible. It's about Saratoga. Ah. And in the book, they uh, a couple times they reference a group of men that watched in line with him. Gates wanted these guys at Saratoga. Washington had, and they called them Morgan's Riflemen, though. Not Morgan's men, but I'm willing to bet that, uh, that's got to be the same. They were Morgan's Riflemen in the book. They're a group of guys that were excellently trained in sharpshooting, mm -hmm. and they did very well in battle in West Virginia. But I'm just surprised they didn't mention Morgan's riflemen in this. This Morgan's men. It's got to be the same. Same. Guy. It must be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. did, did he you was mention? in Washington, FYI. Oh. <laughs> 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 Can you make it? Well, go ahead, Brian. No, he did, uh, the guy who did the research on the book was a. Uh, guy, forty some year. He was a he was actually a ranger in um, Normandy oh, and wow. World War Two. And he got out of after World War Two. He became a park ranger in Saratoga. He was there for forty some years. Did the research, the whole nine. It took him years to write the book. Uh, but he knew the battleground, and each branch, and the characters in it. And uh, it's actually it's actually a really good read. It's getting better now. It's beginning of politics. <laughs> <laughs> now it's still water. <laughs> American circles. So I would say yes, mm -hmm. you know, because he was encouraged, and maybe it wasn't all the group that encouraged him to collect them as a pamphlet. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, at least he was able to print loads of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He had the press. Yeah. Had the press. Yeah. There is a battle that um, Scarlet Brings is in New York called the Battle of Brooklyn, and sometimes the Battle of Long Island. Mm -hmm. And um, it was one of the first letters that I started when I, that I did when I started writing. Um, this woman named Kathleen was asking for it every year. And this group called the Maryland 400 were killed. They were all Irishmen, all Irish boys, really. They were killed um, defending the old stone house in Greenwood Cemetery, which is in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So they have a ceremony almost every summer. Really? And it's dedicated to the Irish in the American Revolution. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So. Yeah, we'll have to have a field trip at least. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is amazing, you know, having written the thing outside, or, or the exhibit outside of the early America, you know, and to add these points, like the fact that there is this, you know, there's a northern contingent, which of course, was Irish, you know, but and Protestants from Dublin who would have been very obviously Irish, you know. So it, it's a it's a mixed group. But then when you see the names there, you know, McCarthy's and O'Connor's and very clearly, you know, Irish mm -hmm. rural names, you know, it's amazing to think how many of them are over here. And maybe some of them had come over as indentured servants or, you know, their families had come as indentured servants originally and now here they are fighting, you know. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great story. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting, you know, that this is t 
taken over a party like that has a massive international <laughs> concern, you know, with the the war and things. You know, it, you would imagine. I mean, it was probably sidelined, really. You know, we are interested in it, but I wonder how much did the Democratic Party, you know, focus on it? If, if Williams is, you know, uh, his comments, you know, they were kind yeah. of hateful, really. You know, yeah, very mm-hmm. much so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I really, again, I don't know enough of the political or the historical side. Mm-hmm. Even what his reputation was mm-hmm. in the Senate. Right. And Wilson is kind of seen as not super pro Irish, you know, in the end. So, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, I think, that's happening in American politics, you know. That, mm-hmm. Yeah. And probably had uh, had Wilson changed course before the convention yeah. and Glenn had still given a, a, one of the, the keynote speeches, we all, we all would have known about him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe today. But that really stopped his political mm-hmm. aspirations. Uh, mm-hmm. And I suppose he was, uh, I mean, pro neutrality because of the Irish question. You know, a lot of Irish Americans were pro neutral, so that kind of makes sense. You know, that Wilson sort of betrays them. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe he wouldn't have agreed to give that convention mm-hmm. talk had Wilson been had it been more clearly that they were going yeah, to yeah, yeah. join the war. Join the war, right? Did he become prominent in Irish American organizations? I mean, did he have a, a leadership role? In the <laughs> or I think in the state. More, That's you know, it. there were several articles in the paper where he gave a talk at various organ. You know, there was a Robert Emmett, Robert Emmett organization as well as the Friends of All Ireland, yeah. Hibernians, mm-hmm. um, St. Patrick's Society, mm-hmm. and so. Yeah, but beyond that, I don't know. And one of the tragedies of his life, and I didn't mention this, is I said he died in 1924, which is another reason probably why we don't know too much about him. Yeah. And this was right after. He really did something remarkable, and we should probably have a later talk, where as a liaison between Ireland and, and Great Britain, he meets with Lloyd George, mm-hmm. and they're kind of off the books. And he was going to write about this, but um, I mentioned he had that chronic back pain. He committed suicide in 1924. Mm-hmm. The back pain was so extreme, and he, he had to wear, really for most of his adult life, this corset under it. If you sometimes look at pictures of him, they seem so stiff. And Pat Hale, actually, our, our trustee, whose grandmother worked for the Glens, was the one who, without causing uh, extreme pain, could get that corset on every morning. He had to be wrapped. Oh, great. Yeah. And so I think that chronic pain just mm-hmm. built up and you know, he killed himself in 1924 before he ever wrote his own memoirs. Mm-hmm. Which they hid, the fact that he'd oh, killed they, himself. I think they yeah. had a heart complaint or yeah. you know, a headache pain that had been rushed to hospital. But, right. Yeah. Right, I know, so sad mm-hmm. that that happened um, because his memoirs would have been fascinating. Mm-hmm. So the only, the only primary sources we have is this whole, uh, his meeting with Lloyd George comes from three newspaper articles that are reprinted by several newspapers for a while and resurrected when he does die. But that's it for this story that's like a cloak and dagger story of mm-hmm. you know, having to get into a black car that drops him off someplace and he's got to give the note to somebody else who goes down to the corner and you know, wave his three fingers and <laughs> you know, the, the ways he got to De Valera. Um, he met with Michael Collins and, and then Lloyd George. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I look forward to that talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, is anyone, any other questions or comments? Well, that was brilliant, I guess. You were doing course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that light in the back is so blinding. <laughs>